This is case 10. All right. 34-year-old uh, female with a slow-growing trunk lesion. Let's see where the top of the skin is. Oh, let me wipe it off a little bit. Okay. So here's the skin surface up here. Here's our lesion down here. So what did you think uh, that this was? Uh, so it's a spindle cell lesion. Mm -hmm. It's definitely dissecting down into the subcutaneous fat. Yeah, um, way down, huh? Yeah. And um, looking at how it is, it's deeper than, more than superficial, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then down here, um, it has a little bit of a different pattern than the rest of it. Yeah, let's go up here. Yeah, it does. Um, so, yeah, it kind of has a, a variety of different appearances, like the cellularity is a lot more down right. here, right? And it's kind of almost making fascicles a little bit, kind of vaguely making fascicles. Over here, it gets much more like kind of fibrous and collagenous and less cellular. Some areas are solid, some areas have fat in it. Right. All right, so what do you think it is? I thought this was a DFSP, and I was wondering if that part down there was a little bit different, was like a fibrosarcominous transformation. Excellent job. Very good. Definitely this is DFSP, and we haven't even looked at the cytology really yet. Not much, right? But I'll tell you, this pattern, until you prove what else it is, DFSP has got to be on your list, and there are a few other things that can trap fat like this, but this is the fat trap and we're talking about for DFSP. Not like a little bit of, you know, pushing down the fat. We're talking about islands, clusters of fat stranded and squished in the middle of the tumor, right? And I wish I could go lower power to show you, but like, look, this is the person's normal skin. Epidermis, dermis, here, right around where the eccrine coils are, that's where the subcutis starts. The, the dermal subcutaneous junction is right around where the eccrine coils live. So if you ever have something that's all tumor and you can't tell it, once you see the eccrine coils, you know you're getting pretty close to the subcutis. So it's a nice, useful, um, normal histology clue. And then normally, the subcutis is fat, right? With the exception of the fibrous um, septa in between the lobules of adipocytes, which we often don't see big enough chunks of fat to be able to see those lobules. But then over here, you can see that the, this is all used to be subcutis, and it's been wiped out by tumor. This stuff here wasn't dermis. This was subcutis, and it's wiped out everything and only left a few little stranded adipocytes or what's even more helpful, these clusters, little clumps of adipocytes that are being squeezed to death, right? They're just being choked out by the tumor, okay? So that's the way I think it's so helpful is that the, the used to be pristine subcutaneous real estate wiped out and overrun by the spindle cells, okay? And the spindle cells of DFSP, down here is probably the best place, are thin, elongated, and bland. They look almost neural a lot of times. And it can be very easy to confuse this tumor with a, the diffuse type of neurofibroma, which also can intermingle with fat and also stains with what is this tumor stain with again? Uh, so this will stain with CD34. CD34, right. And so do neurofibromas, by the way. So, so if you need to tell them part, use an S100. I used to say you would never see S100 in a DFSP, but I have actually seen one case now confirmed with molecular that had patchy but strong S100 staining, which was really shocking. And it was a fibrosarcomatous DFSP. I just uh, saw that this year, actually. So that was totally mind-blowing for me. The more you do this stuff, you'll eventually see all the rules get broken, I think. That's if you're a pathologist long enough. All the book pages will have exceptions on them. So, But the cells do not look atypical, right? And that's what sometimes people get confused. They see an ugly pleomorphic thing in the skin, and they think, could be DFSP. And that tells me they've never seen a DFSP before. Because DFSP do not have pleomorphism with the very, very rarest of case reportable exceptions I've seen one time a case that was radiated and got some wild pleomorphism. And there was a case, I think, from Spain that got published that they confirmed, but it looked like a pleomorphic sarcoma, like UPS, but it was molecularly proven. So rare stuff happens, but for practical purposes, 99.99999% of these are going to be bland because they're translocation sarcomas, aren't they? So, and then the, we always teach that what these have is a, uh, a really striking swirled world story form pattern. But sometimes you can get kind of some vague fascicles. They really can run a range of features. When you get nice story form pattern, it's great. But you don't always have that. I mean, but look, would you ever look at a picture of this and think, oh, is it sarcoma? No. no. It sure doesn't look malignant, right? So this is one of those, and it kind of looks neural. So when I'm thinking of a neural tumor or a perineurioma or something, and S100 is negative, 
And 34 is positive. I always think of DFSP. There are lots of other things that can look that way, like low-fat spindle cell lipoma and a variety of other things. But when I've got a small biopsy and I see a 34 positive bland spindle cell thing and I can't really see the fat, I often will send those for fish to rule out DFSP. Because, you know, if most of the differential will be benign things, but if it's DFSP, they're going to go do a huge surgery, either Mohs or a wide local excision with a couple centimeters of margin, big surgery. So um, even though these don't usually metastasize or cause the patient to die, which is good, they can be locally aggressive and the surgeries can be very morbid. And I, I'm in a couple of DFSP patient support groups on Facebook, and I've seen the, the very dramatic scars these patients have, and it really made me um, have a greater respect for this tumor. So, um, and then up here... I'll show you, you won't like it, but see, there's some collagen trapping. So even though we love that for DF, I definitely see DFSPs on a regular basis with a bit of collagen trapping. So, so that's nice to look for, but don't rely too heavily on it. But I think the one thing that would help me is these cells are very thin. And usually DFSP has more, I'm sorry, dermatofibromas have more plump, juicy, fat kind of cells, but not always. Some dermatofibromas have thin, spindly cells, and those are the times where CD34 can really help. And again, seeing a, if you see a whole, the whole lesion, it's easier. If you only see a superficial shave, though, be very wary because it's easy on a superficial biopsy to miss a diagnosis of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And now, uh, oh, and let's see where else is going to show. This is the other thing is as it snakes out, it trickles through the fat like this. And so it can be very difficult to assess margins on these, particularly at frozen. And I've done it before. The Mohs surgeon has uh, a handful of times I've sat with the Mohs surgeon. We've looked at margins and it can be challenging. But seeing that, that kind of bland spindle cells filling up spaces between the fat, that's tumor. Those are all tumor cells. And you might say, well, just do CD34 at the margins. Well, yeah, but 34 stains pretty much the normal background dermis. Some of the subcutis will stain with 34. So it's a much harder stain to interpret. What we really need is like a specific DFSP stain, but so far none is, uh, has been discovered that I know of. So over here, let's go to your question. I think that this probably does represent fibrosarcomatous transformation. The problem is we only have a small area, but see right here, it's definitely more cellular than the rest of the tumor. Right. And it's beginning to sweep into these fascicles. And the fascicles have, it's a little bit, you have to hallucinate a little bit, but they got a bit of a herringbone pattern. See how they're kind of running at sharp angles, kind of into each other, and they're flowing right. together. I don't know the right way to describe it visually, but uh, to me, that is certainly suspicious. So sometimes if I see, like say this was the biopsy, this is probably actually part of a bigger excision, if I recall. And, um, and there were more obvious areas elsewhere. But if I had a biopsy with just one area like that, I would probably say DFSP and with a comment that there's an area that's starting to get fascicular and I'm concerned it could be fibrosarcomatous, compare it with the excision specimen. The good news, they're going to treat it the same way. They take it out with a margin and then we look at the whole excision specimen. And although the fibrosarcomatous uh, DFSPs are reported to have a bit of a higher risk of metastasis, something like 15% in most studies, not all, but most studies, uh, whereas regular DFSP is probably closer to like 2% or maybe less. I think I've only seen one DFSP that's metastasized and I've seen many, many DFSPs. So, um, so they do have a somewhat higher risk of METs, but the treatment to my knowledge is basically the same. But even in these higher grade areas, look, they're still pretty uniform looking cells. They're not, you're not going to see wild pleomorphism. You may see a bit more mitotic activity, but they can be quite, um, quite subtle. All right. So that is dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, a really nice example. And that's why they're so problematic is because they're just so infiltrated into the fat and you really got to go way around to get them out. And that leaves, of course, a huge scar for the patient. So, um, and they're clinically often misdiagnosed as like cysts and lip, uh, lipoma, scar. There's like a flattened form that looks like scar. So everyone, you, you learn them as being these multi-nodular protuberant uh, things, which is why we call them dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. But we actually did a study with the Facebook group where we had patients um, tell us what theirs looked like and how long it took to diagnose. And a lot of them presented as a flat plaque. And some of those never became nodular. They just stayed plaque-like. And then once they were finally biopsied years later, sometimes turned out to be DFSP, not a scar or a keloid or a birthmark or whatever they wow. had thought. So it's a really challenging uh, tumor um, to diagnose clinically and sometimes microscopically as well. And oh yes, we didn't talk. What is the molecular um, abnormality? So it's got a uh, collagen 1A1 and PGFB. Uh, fusion, which is Good. location on 1722. Yeah. Excellent. And that is what the vast majority have. But in the past couple of years, we've discovered that there's actually a second um, alternate fusion that involves PDGFD. PDGFD as in dog or delta. 
So, um, and it can, I think there's a couple different things that might be able to fuse with, I'm not sure, but we um, actually, we, I've seen um, a, one case of that in my practice and I'm working on writing up a, a report of that and partnering with someone else who had a case um, to, because there's only been, I don't know, I think maybe a dozen of them in the literature or 10, but I, I think that they're probably out there because I've seen things that look like, like DFS people were negative on fish and thinking back now, I suspect probably some of those were, were those alternate fusion ones That's that we sure. just didn't know. Um, existed. So now what I do is uh, if I have a case like this, this is classic. There's no need to do fish. This is DFSP. We're done. So, I mean, honestly, don't really need to do CD34 for this. I, to me, I feel comfortable without it. But, um, but uh, if I, when I use the fish is particularly when I'm like, it's a, I've got a small biopsy of a spindle cell thing and I'm either pretty sure it's not DFSP, but it's bland and CD34 positive. And I'm either going to tell them this is a benign thing, leave it alone, or go back and do a huge surgery. Why not do the fish? It's not that expensive, and it's a pretty good test. So that's when I'll use fish. Or, again, when I've got a, a biopsy that I'm pretty sure is the FSP, but I can't really see any fat trapping because they just did a punch biopsy. I want to definitively prove it so they can go straight to definitive surgery. I feel like telling them, go back and get me a bigger biopsy, sometimes that'll work. But other times, it may not still solve the problem. And then we're now, after two biopsies are done, now we're still debating what to do. And I figure... I'll just do the fish and a week later we got an answer. So for obvious cases, no problem, but for small biopsies or difficult cases um, where, where you've done your 34 and it's positive and you're still not sure, the fish can be really helpful. And if I do, if I'm sus suspicious enough to do fish and it comes back as uh, negative for collagen 1A1 PDGFB, then I'll reflexively just go straight to do PDGFD just in case. Uh, since I have seen that one. And that one, I actually had a low index of suspicion for. I was like, it probably is not, but I didn't know what else to do with it. And I did the fish and I couldn't believe that it was positive. So it was a real learning lesson for me and very humbling.